so good morning. As all of you should know, I'm Greg Blackall. I'm one of the broker managers at Florida Luxury. And today I'm going to walk you guys through how to create an effective CMA report. So a CMA is a comparative market analysis. And essentially what it is is the tools that we use or the, the documentation that we use to establish a value of a person's home. Uh, we do have some additional paperwork and things in the back office. You could use the Ask Luxy feature and type CMA report and you can get some of those. So the purpose and objectives of today's class, we're going to learn about the available tools that will help you win the listing property, help you win listing properties at market value. We're going to learn detailed strategies that will help you win with the seller in choosing you over the competition and agreeing with a list price that will accomplish selling and leveraging the highest purchase price. And then we're going to walk through a demonstration of actually creating a CMA report using the company tools, MLS, and other available products and services. I don't know why that A was in there. So how do you prepare a CMA that sets you and your seller up for success? So you see this little and right there? That's a big ant. And we always say there are big butts. This is a big and. So you need to have a CMA that's going to set you up for success, but also set your sellers up for success. So successful CMA, we've all known, or you soon will if you haven't been in the business very long, of those agents who make a habit of taking listings and just throwing whatever price the seller wants on them. Oh, you want to list it for five hundred thousand? Sure, we'll list it for that because what the the agent is hoping for is that they're going to get a buyer call off the sign in the yard that they can actually sell them something that's priced correctly. So unfortunately, there are a lot of agents out there and I've been in listing presentations where they go, oh, you know, Joe Schmo down the street told me that I could get 500,000 for this house. Well, I've got all the numbers in front of me. Your house is 450, 465. You know, yeah, they want the listing, but they're not interested in actually selling your house. So they take those homes that are way more than the market supports in hopes that the seller will eventually agree, agree to reduce the home to a sellable price. So we set ourselves up for success by using real and accurate picture of the listing, as well as the local market in which the home will compete. Now, when at all possible, you want to schedule a preview appointment or at the very least do a telephone consultation with the seller. If you do get the preview, show up with pen and paper or in my case, I've got the phone with the stylus so I can just keep all the notes on my phone. And actually make notes, have the seller walk you through the house and kind of tell you about the features that cause them to want to build or buy that house. Because in all likelihood, whatever it was that sold them on the house is what will likely sell the next buyer on the house as well. If you can only do a phone consult, then there's some questions we're going to go through. Now, if you are able to get that preview appointment, think about these things. How does the home look? Is it clean? Is it cluttered? Is it organized? Is it crowded? Does it have too much furniture? Do you see any damage that would impact the value? As you walk through, look at the ceiling, see if there's any indications of a current or previous roof leak or anything like that that somebody's going to notice. And then paint colors. You know, I always tell buyers, paint is cheap. But if you walk into a room and it's like fluorescent purple, you know, there's some buyers that are going, oh, I don't know about that. So just pay attention to those things. How does the home smell? So for me, this is a big one. I can walk into a house and just pick up odors almost immediately. So how does it smell? Are there pet owners? Are there stains? Does it smell stale? Does it smell moldy? You know those homes that the AC hasn't been on in a while and it just sort of sits and then you walk in and you're like, ugh, it's just not a good smell. So these are things that are going to impact because if you can smell it, so can the buyer. So that's why we want to know these things in advance because we can work to get ahead of them. You know, put some fans on, turn the air conditioning on, do something like that to kind of get these smells out of the house. Are there any updates? You want to try and get the dates for when things were done. The AC, the roof, has the kitchen been updated? Any of the bathrooms been updated? When was the flooring done? What are the types of flooring? Because the number one question you'll get when you have a listing is what is the age of the AC in the roof? Every single listing, a buyer's going to ask, what's the age of the AC in the roof? They just 
have to know. So if you can get this information up front, then you're better prepared to be able to evaluate that. Additionally, the air conditioning and the roof specifically are two big ticket items that could potentially derail a deal. So if you get in there, even though there's no roof leak, but the roof is 22 years old, a buyer is going to have an issue with it. Now, if you're trying to get absolute top value of the market, but somebody's going to have to put a $15,000 roof on, you know, you're going to have an issue with it. So ask these questions or, you know, go through these things when you're walking through the house. If you can't actually preview the home, then we need to ask some questions. How many bedrooms? How many bathrooms? What is the square footage? Ask them and then compare it to what it says in the tax record. Because I've had people that go, oh, it's a three bedroom, two bath, 2,200 square feet. You get into tax records, it's a two bedroom, two bath with an unpermitted garage conversion. And they're counting the garage in the 2,200 square feet, but it's the tax records say 1,700. So you want to find out if there are any discrepancies. Have they done any updates in the last few years? Now, if you replaced the AC 12 years ago, okay, well, that's not going to do a lot of good. So I typically say in the last three to five years, what's been updated? When was the roof and AC replaced? We talked about that. Does the home have a pool? Is it an above ground or a below ground pool? Do you think there's a difference in value? If I have a $250 Walmart above ground pool versus a $40,000 concrete in ground pool, you want to know these things because we want to find comparables that are the same. Is the house or pool solar? Is it salt water? Does it have a heater? Those kinds of things. Does the home sit on a waterfront lot or conservation or anything else that would impact the value? Because again, if I can't be there to see it, I want to make sure that I'm comparing it to other similar properties. If you've got a corner conservation lot with no neighbors and you know all these things, that's going to positively impact the value compared to a home that had houses on every side in the eyes of the buyer. So we want to know these things. And then does the home have an HOA? Why do you guys think that's important to know? Okay. What else? That's necessary to disclose anyway, right? Well, it is definitely. So part of it would be, you know, having the right paperwork when you go to do the listing. HOAs have fees as well. Correct. There's some additional costs involved. Not only that, but an HOA is going to maintain how a community is kept. So an HOA community is going to have rules about you can't have cars in the front yard. Oh, no, that's okay. I'm just making sure it wasn't something important. Um, they're going to have rules. So let's say it's not an HOA community and the home next door has three cars on blocks in the front yard. Even though it has nothing to do with our house, do you think it's going to impact the value or the perceived value? Absolutely. So if it's in an HOA community, then I can be reasonably confident that all of the homes are going to be maintained in approximately the same condition. If it's not an HOA community, then I can't make that same assumption. So, you know, then I may be doing a drive-by before the listing appointment to kind of see how the neighborhood looks. Is it well-maintained? Is it kept up? Is it you know, dilapidated. Do you have to drive through a series of trailers before you get to this $500,000 home? You know, different things like that. Because in a buyer's mind, this is all going to have an impact on the perceived value of this home. We also have the FLR pre-appointment script, the listing pre-appointment script. This is in the back office and it's a good thing to review so that you can go through some of the questions and things that you want to ask and kind of be comfortable with that. Now, in the past, we've had questions regarding the zoning of a property, you know, especially in all this new construction going out 54 and even out here on 52, they have a lot of new properties that are coming in. So you have properties that were originally zoned as A, as agriculture. You know, they were just huge farms. Well, now all of a sudden these builders are putting homes on it and they're changing the zoning. So now what was an A, property is now an R, R1 or R2. C typically represents commercial. I or M is industrial manufacturing. MH typically means mobile homes and P are zoned for parking lots. Now, the reason this is important is because codes can vary from county to county. 
So an R1 in Pasco may mean something completely different than an R1 in Hernando or Pinellas. So we need to just be aware of what the zones are and if there's any proposed changes to it. And why do you guys think that's important? For future use of the, of the property? Future use is part of it. Taxes are the other. Mm. Agricultural land is taxed much, much lower than residential property. So sometimes, depending on how early you're purchasing in a phase, your first year of taxes may still be zoned on the agricultural value of the property. Then your second year, all of a sudden your taxes go up, you know, 20, 30 percent because the zoning of the property had changed from a farm to a neighborhood. So it's just something to be aware of, especially with some of the new construction. Now, the takeaway from this is after speaking to the Florida Re Realtor Legal Services Helpline, we really shouldn't be getting involved with questions regarding zoning. We should direct clients to the county zoning board. And what happens is if we give them information and we say, oh yeah, this property is zoned, you know, agricultural or whatever, and then all of a sudden something changes, we can actually be held liable for providing incorrect information. So it's one of those, yes, people are going to ask, is it zoned residential? Can I have horses out here? Can I have, you know, those kinds of things? We typically just are advised to direct them to the county zoning board and have them ask their questions to that governing body directly. Uh, the same thing is true. Let's try that again. The same thing is true regarding school zones. We should not be providing this information in our listings, or at minimum, we should have a disclosure that says information is presumed to be correct, but should be verified by the buyer. I'll give you an example where I live in Trinity, Starkey Ranch was zoned for Mitchell High School. A ton of people bought in Starkey because they wanted Mitchell High School. Well, the school just, or the county just went in and rezoned, and now Starkey's getting sent to River Ridge. And they are furious. They've owned this home for a year. They paid top dollar because they wanted Mitchell High School. And Mitchell High School is at 122% capacity. River Ridge is at 81% capacity. They're moving those kids to the school that has capacity until five years from now or seven years from now when the school will be built. But people specifically bought that community for that school zone. And then a year later, the county changed it. And they're coming back to the realtors going, well, you told me my kid could go to Mitchell. Well, no. The school zone at the time you bought the house said your kid went to Mitchell. Unfortunately, they changed that. So that's why we really want to be very, very careful because as soon as we make something in writing, we are now legally held to it. So typically when I put my listings in, I don't put any school information whatsoever. I don't put what school they're zoned for. You know, I live in Foxwood in Trinity and literally the elementary school is outside the entrance of our community. It's probably a pretty safe bet that anybody that lives in that community is gonna go to that school. But who knows? You know, I can't, I don't wanna be the person it puts those things in writing without some sort of cover your butt disclosure. So those are just a few things to kind of touch on with zoning and school zones. Now, when you go into the listing presentation, you're gonna walk in always assuming that you're walking out with signed paperwork. So all the questions that you're asking will make the seller see that you're thorough and specific but also show that you're taking the time to learn about their home to ensure that you can get them the most accurate analysis possible. So let's say just for an example that I'm talking to somebody that says, hey, I'm interested in having you potentially come list my home. Okay, great. It's a three bedroom, two bath, two car garage. Okay, cool. Let me work up some comps, I'll be there tomorrow. Do I really have enough information to find good comparables for this home? No. I don't know if you have a pool. I don't know if you're on a conservation lot. I don't know if you just did a full remodel of this house, or I don't know if it's original to 1977. So I want to go through and ask those questions. And what's important to note is people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So if you go in and it's all about just me making a sale, I'm just here to sell your house. Don't really care about you. I'm just here because this is my job. People see through that. 
You have to actually take an interest and take a value in them to make sure that they understand that you are there to fulfill a need that they have. They need to sell their home. It's not about the business. Yes, I am the professional that can do that for you, but ultimately I have to be there for you and you have to kind of convey that. And it, it is a difficult thing for some new agents specifically because they're just so excited about the opportunity of having this listing. And the seller's like, okay, cool. It's great that it's about you, but what about me? Everybody subscribes to WIFM. What's in it for me? So we have to think from the salesperson perspective that we have to make it about the seller. We are the person that can fulfill their needs. We are the means to their end. So now some quick strategies for your CMA. Be specific about which properties you include. So don't just go, oh, that's a 3 2, 1,000 square feet, and my house is you know, a 3 2, 1,100 square feet. I'm just gonna grab every single one of them. Well, you could, but there are some factors in there that may not make all things equal. Just because it has the same number of bedrooms and bathrooms doesn't mean it's necessarily a good comparable. A good CMA takes a little bit of time and work, but it's always time well spent when you get in front of the seller. And then be aware of other properties that have sold in the neighborhood, even if they aren't comparable. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit more. There we go. So these are my CMA rules. This is kind of the takeaway of the overreaching part of this class. So when you're looking for comparable homes, these are kind of my rules. Now they're not always hard and fast, but this is a good place to start. With year built, I try to stay within five years. So what happens is I've got a neighborhood where 90% of the homes were built in 1978 and then a new section got added and all these homes were built in 2005. Okay, well, I don't want to compare the 2005 properties to the 1978 properties because they're not going to be valued the same. You've got a home that's 40 years old versus a home that's 12 years old, 15 years old. For the size, I try to stay within 10% on either side. So if it's 1,500 square feet, I'll go 1,650 to 1,450. You know, I want to kind of keep it, or 1,350. I want to keep it within about 10% if you can. Now, Inevitably, you're gonna have the home that's either overbuilt for the community or it's the smallest home in the community. So to find any sort of comparable, morning, you're going to have to go more than 10%, but if you can stay in there, we try. For bedrooms and bathrooms, you try to stay similar, but no more than plus or minus one either way. So if it's a three, two, I don't really wanna compare it to like a two, one, because in terms of market value, they're not going to be the same. Now, if I've got a two bedroom, two bath, I don't want to compare it to a four two. I want to try and keep them as similar as I can. And then for yard size, again, stay similar within about 10% if you can. Uh, it's in a neighborhood, if they're all just regular lots, you know, 65 foot lots, then they're all going to be pretty similar. Uh, there's communities like Golden Acres, for example. Some of them are half an acre, some of them are two and a half acres. So you wanna keep that in mind. And then whether they have a pool or no pool. So you wanna to try to only use the same as the subject, otherwise you'll need to adjust the comparable value accordingly. And then there's three primary ways to create a CMA. Matrix or the MLS, Cloud CMA, and NAR RPR. There is no one perfect system. I wish I could come up here and say, you know what, this is the only system you need to use. This is the one that works, just use this. But unfortunately, there really isn't. Uh, so we're gonna look at all three. And each one has pros and cons, and once we go through them, we'll kind of talk through the pros and cons. So the first is going to be Matrix, and I found a property this morning that's active. So let's go over and take a look at it. So let's go into Matrix, let me make sure. This is still logged in. Okay, it is. So we're gonna say this is our, our sample property. So it's a three bedroom, two bath, no pool, been on the market 120 days, and it's 1636 square feet. The AC was replaced in 2018, the water heater in 2017, and the HOA includes garbage, maintenance-free landscaping, and irrigation. So those are all good things to know. So what we want to do then is go into matrix 
and I want to search for properties. Let's see, maybe actual address. I want to look for properties within, we're going to say a quarter mile of this address. And I really want two to four bedroom, two to three bathrooms. And I didn't see which one this is built, but in this neighborhood, this shouldn't be a big deal. And I also want to look at what's pending and what has sold in the last 180 days. Let me clear this so you guys can see that. So that gives me 19 matches. So let's come over here to results and let's take a look. We've got, actually, what did I say? This one was 1317 and it's 1600 square feet. So I really want to do 1400 to 1850, 1850. There we go. That way I can kind of hone in on what we actually have. <coughs> so again, we have 1636, 1661, 1646, 1626, 1565, 1581. So you see how all of these are approximately the same size. What this is going to do is it's going to give me a better, a better idea of what these are. So let's just take a look. Since this is an actual listing, we can take a quick look and see what it looks like. If I was talking to the seller, I would get this information from them directly. Um, okay, so we've got granite in the kitchen, white appliances, hardwood floors. Okay, we got carpet in the bedrooms, tray That's ceiling. That's our subject, right? Correct, this is our subject property. But because I don't actually know this property, I'm just looking to get answers to the questions. It looks like we have granite in the bathroom. Yep, we do. Uh, tile, looks like the paint's in pretty good shape. Tile surrounding the shower. Carpet in the other rooms as well. Okay, the other bathroom, a nice organized laundry room, a not so organized bedroom. It must be a teenager's bedroom. Um, kind of a sitting area in the back part. Okay, windows, nice high ceilings, okay. So this gives us a pretty good idea of what we're looking at. Uh, what I want to do is I want to see the backyard. So looks like we have some fencing, good covered patio area. Okay. So nice manicured backyard, kind of a patio slab, no pool, but it does back up to a pond. So that's helpful information. Okay. And we're back to the beginning. Okay, so this gives me a pretty good idea of what we have. So I'm going to grab this one and then let's take a look at the next one. Again, same thing, let's just work backwards. This does have a pond behind it. We're showing some community amenities. This one is not updated. So we've got a bathroom that still has Corian and looks more original. Um, wood floors throughout, so we don't have carpet in the bedrooms, it doesn't look like. A uh, non-updated bathroom. We have an office, which is probably one of the second bedrooms, but we do have hardwoods throughout. Okay. Kitchen hasn't been updated, no granite. Okay. So we're going to use this one, but we're going to kind of make some adjustments with it as well. And then let's see. So what I'm going through, this one again backs up to a pond, looks like. This one has been updated, although I don't think that is granite. Can't really tell from that photo though. Doesn't look like it. Looks like big granite. Yeah, exactly. But it has been updated. It's not truly original. Um, you got tile floors throughout, so you don't have carpet. Uh, I take that back, you do still have carpet in that bedroom. The bathroom hasn't been updated. The faucet looks like it has. Um, still the original tile door. So some floors, this one's kind of a, what I would call a midline update. Um, some of it's been done, but it's not fully redone. Uh, okay, so let's just grab that. One tree, okay. 
So again, you notice all these homes look pretty similar from the, the outside. Uh, laminate flooring, non-updated kitchen. Okay. There. That must be across the street. Okay, so big patio area. The back is up to conservation, so it doesn't have rear neighbors, but it doesn't have water either. Um, looks like they changed out a bathtub. Haven't updated the counters. Carpet, same tray ceiling. Non-updated third or uh, other bathroom. Okay, so we're just gonna grab these. I'm taking a little bit more time on these just to kind of show you what I'm looking at when I go through them. Uh, this one is 1565. I'm going to grab that. Uh, this one's 1581. I'll grab that. Now, normally I would go through all of these and actually check them out. The one that I'm not sure about is this one because this one's almost 1800 square feet. So I suspect that it's going to have kind of a different feel. There's like a screen and patio. Interesting. It does. And that's where I'm almost thinking that in this case, I wouldn't use this home as a comparable uh, because it does have kind of a very different feel than what we've looked at with the others. Yeah, exactly. So this one is not truly a good comparable. Uh, and this one's 18, 16 square feet. So let's see what this looks like. Cause again, it's kind of right on the verge. So this one does have granite, the wood or laminate floors, stainless appliances, carpet in the bedrooms, um, tile surrounds, okay. Okay, so this one's close enough that I would I would still consider this. I wanted to see. It doesn't really show what's behind it. I think in this neighborhood they're all conservation. Yeah, I think so, because I didn't see any that backed up to any others. It's just the pond. Right, the pond or the conservation. So behind it, or down here at the bottom, you see that you have this CMA button. So if you click CMA, it actually goes through. So let me see. I think I've got myself in here. I can do the description. I can go over to pages and I can choose which pages I want. By default, it doesn't pick any for me. So I'll do my cover and if I wanna see what's included, I can choose there. For the subjects or adjustments, we'll do the subject list. Um, I don't like doing adjustments in here just because it's more difficult to do. I'm gonna show you guys the adjustments more in Cloud CMA and RPR. For the comparables, I like having this one, the list price and sales chart. Um, let's do side by side of the sold. This is some extra information you could put in there. Activity versus timing is a good one. My guarantee to you, you'd want to read through that and see if it's one you'd want to include. Uh, the importance of pricing is a good one. And then if you want to include the CMA map. So this is just me doing a very quick selection. Matrix needs the details of the subject property. So enter across property. Search for realist, search for across property. And we'll just do it manually. In this case, because this is what you would actually do is if you were taking a listing, you wouldn't have this in the MLS. So we would just say, correct. Yeah. Um, this is this is wind tree. And so for here, it's a three bedroom, two bath, two full bath, one floor, two car garage, no pool. And then we can actually go through and go to our cover. 
This would show you what your cover looks like. So it's got your picture, your name, your information. If you want to change any of it, you can put it up here in your contact information. It shows the properties that we selected. So we're just going to grab all of these. I think this, yeah, this did not include the other one that I wanted. So this is the information of our comparables. It'll show us the map. So that way, number one is actually our subject property. Um, it shows down here, warning subject property couldn't be mapped because I put in an address that doesn't exist in this range. Otherwise it would put a little yellow mark for where the subject is. In this case, we know it's number one. So you can see that all of these are in the same neighborhood, the same area. If I had one that was, you know, all the way up here, maybe in another neighborhood, then I wouldn't include it. So this is just a good way to double check and make sure. Now in here, I could make adjustments and I'm gonna show you guys the form. Actually, I've got it my downloads. Um, I'm gonna email this form to everybody when we're done. But in this form, you have value adjustments. So you can make adjustments for year, for bedrooms, if it has a half bathroom, a full bathroom, a garage bay, for fireplace, granite versus formica, corian versus formica, if the property is fenced in, an in-ground pool, if the pool is heated, if it has a spa, the difference between a tile and a shingle roof, if it's a golf course lot, if it has a boat dock or a boat lift. And it shows at the different price points. So if it's zero to 150,000, you would use this first column. 150 to 250, it would do this, 250 to 400, four to 750 or over 750. So it gives you an idea of if I find, if I don't have a lot of good comparables, I can use ones that don't fit and then I can actually come in here and make a judgment to make adjustments to them. So this is helpful and this is something I tend to use when I'm going through just to make sure that I'm assigning the right value. So in this case, I could go in and say, okay, well, this Dale side lane didn't have granite. Okay, well, my subject property does. So if I come in here for granite for mica, we're in the 150 to 250 range. So I would assign and, or I would add 35 to six, 3,500 to $6,000 to the comparable property to bring up the value to make it comparable to mine. So if the, subject property is better then you subtract from i'm sorry sba so if the subject property is better then you add so for example the subject property had granite and the comparable did not so i would add the value of the granite to this house because i want them to be comparable does that make sense and then if the comparable property is better then you subtract so if the comparable had granite, but mine did not, I would subtract the value for these things. So it's CBS is if the comparable is better than subtract or SBA, if the subject is better than you add. You don't ever adjust the value of your subject. You only adjust the value of the comparables. Does that make sense? Okay. So we can make our adjustments in here if we wanted to. Um, but like I said, in here, I tend not to just because there's not a, a great way to do it. Now I can view my CMA and I'll show you exactly what it looks like using matrix. I'll tell you guys, this is kind of my quick and dirty. If I'm trying to put a CMA and they're like, Hey, I need you here in half an hour. This is how I would do it because I can just do it very quickly. Um, but it's not, not the best way. So it's got my information at the top and that's fuzzy even on my screen. I don't know why. So I'm sure it's fuzzy up there. So research and prepared by me, the subject property address, prepared exclusively for, it's gonna have my information at the bottom. This tells a little bit about what a comparative market analysis is. Let me zoom this in so you guys can read it. Uh, this is a value opinion or comparative market analysis and should not be considered an evaluation. We are not licensed appraisers. When making any decision that depends on my work, you should know that I have not followed the guidelines for developing of an evaluation or an analysis contained in the Uniform st Standards of Practice for Professional Evaluation of the Evaluation Foundation, which is what appraisers are held to. 
So this can be summed up to say, I'm not an appraiser. This is my best estimation based on my experience. It's going to show the comparable properties. So our days on market, this one's been on the market 119. This one's been active for 42 and 49. So we have an average of 170. All these are on the same size lots, the 0.14 acres. They're all approximately the same size. So this will show you, this is why I use these properties because they're very similar. Of the ones that have sold, also three bedroom, two baths, 1645 square feet on 0.142. So this one has a slightly larger lot than the others, but our average days on the market are 38. So this would set your expectation that there are some neighborhoods where the average days on the market are 90 to 120 days to go under contract. If that's the case, do I want to take a 60 day listing? No, because I'm setting myself up for success. This neighborhood historically doesn't sell in 60 days. So unless we're doing a fire sale where we're just blowing this thing out to get it gone, a 60 day listing is not going to do you any good. So again, we have our comparable price, a low price of 211, a median of 254, an average of 248, and a high of 260. So this is the range of comparable properties. On average, the sold status, comparable listings in 38 days for, for the last 38 days, or sold, I'm sorry, in 38 days was 242,000. So to hit this average of 38 days on market, homes sold for $242,885. So if, I'm, if I've got a seller that says, hey, I've got a job, I've got to be across the country in 60 days, am I going to list it at the total high end of this neighborhood? Well, no, because at the high end, this one's been on the market 120 days and didn't sell. This one was on the market 73 days. Some of these others sold in 20 and 1 and 20. So in order to sell it more quickly, we've got to be a bit more aggressive on our pricing. This is a price graph to show the list price versus the sold price. And if you notice, there tends not to be a lot of fluctuation, right? So if I've got a seller that says, well, let's list it $15,000 high and we can always negotiate down. Okay, well, historically, homes are selling for very, very close, if not over asking price. In the case of Stroud Court, they actually sold for more than asking price. In all likelihood, it was a buyer who needed down payment assistance. So they sold over the asking price to get cash back on the other side. Um, but if you had a home, let's just use this for example. If this was our list price and everything was selling down here, then okay, maybe I would consider listing it high. But what happens is if these homes are listed truly high, then buyers are just not submitting offers. That's just how this is working in this community. Our sales price is very, very close to our list price. So I want to use that for the seller to let them know we're really, we want to get this price dialed in pretty well. This is kind of our side-by-side -side comparison of the sold properties. So it goes through and just shows, you know, what was put in and things like that. Activity versus timing. This is one that I tend to use. And I show the seller that the bulk of the activity we're going to get on your property will be in the first two weeks. So if we list your house high and then come in three weeks later and do a price reduction, by week three, we have already missed all of these buyers because your house was overpriced. So I really want to price it right, right out of the gate when we have the highest number of eyes on your property to be able to get it sold as quickly as possible. And then again, this is just presented through matrix. It shows at market value, 60% of the buyers are in there. That's because they're getting loans, things like that. They're gonna have to buy at market value. Apparently there's 30% of people who are willing to pay over 10% of market value for a home. I would love to know who these 40% of buyers are because uh, I would wanna work with them all day, but I haven't tend to find very many of those. So. And then the CMA map layout, again, it just shows that all the properties we're, we were using were, you know, right here in the same community, the same general area. And that's the end of the one for matrix. So let me close out of this for a second. Let's go back to our presentation. Sure. Uh, you have a house recently sold as a foreclosure well. 
way lower price. You can share that in your comparison. You can. Um, and with those properties, I tend not to include them because it's not truly an arm's length transaction. It's a property that was sold artificially low because of a situation. So for the most part, if it's a bank owned property that sold very close to what market value is, then I'll include it. But if it was sold for you know 60%, most appraisers now, if they have other good alternatives, they won't use the distressed properties as a comparable. So for the pros, Matrix system is easy to use. It's what we use all the time. It's familiar and the information is easily obtained. All I did was go into search and look within a quarter mile of my subject property. Some of the cons, it's not very pretty. It's just kind of a very thrown together. It's got the MLS kind of branding to it. Uh, it's quick and dirty. It's not really a great format for making adjustments. There's no additional market information included in that. And it's not as easy to brand in a presentation. So let's go over to Cloud CMA. And we're going to use the same property. Um, we're just going to go through it a little bit more quickly. So from your, let me go back here. From your MFR login screen, you have Cloud CMA right here on your screen. It's this little green cloud. And when you click on it, it'll open you up over here to your recent reports. Now, one of the things I'll tell you is with Cloud CMA, if you go over here to your account settings, you want to make sure that you put your picture in there, that you put your company and all those information, any MLS credentials, any custom pasted integration, things like that. Because if you don't, when it goes to generate this information, it won't populate any of your information whatsoever. So before you go in the first time, you want to make sure that you have all your information in there correct. Now, in this case, we're going to do a CMA. And then let's go back out here. Let's back out so I can go back to this property. Here we go. Yes. We'll go back to it. Um, so let me just go back here. There it is. Let's grab this. So. All right. So in here in my cloud CMA, I'm going to put my client, which is going to be Bob Seller. I can put in my private notes. So these are things that I don't want to forget. Three bedroom, two bath, two, oops, not 28, 322, no pool. Uh, water or pond view, uh, you know, those kinds of things. I can pop my property address in here. Oops. That's not what I wanted. Not working fast enough here. Let's try this again. All right. So it actually pops up with that address. And in doing so, it puts in number of square feet, bedrooms, bathrooms. For some reason, in tax records, it doesn't always pull this in. If you have a cover photo, you know, if you've done a drive-by and you just shot a quick photo of the front of the house, you can include it so that it would populate it into this area. Now, when we come down here, we have what's called a quick and dirty search, or we can do ML exact listings. Now, if I had just gone through Matrix and generated that CMA report, I can actually grab those MLS numbers and just drop them in here. The advantage to that is when we're done with this, you'll see that we can customize a lot of the colors and a lot of the information. So I can run a very quick CMA search in the MLS and then just bring those MLS numbers over here. Um, in this case, we're going to do it this way because I want to see how this compares to what we have. So I want to automatically find listings near the subject property. I want to get at least 10 listings and only go back one year for off market. Now, in this case, I can go back six months because I know that I have options. I can do two to four bedrooms. I really want two to three bathrooms, square feet. So we already know this one's 1636. So 1450 to 1800. Lot size I'm not as worried about, and this price I'm not as worried about. So now I'm going to come down here and just click fetch. It's kind of like Fido, just telling it to fetch. 
and it takes just a second, maybe a few seconds on this Wi-Fi. There we go. Now in here, look at how wide of a span I have for what it's searching. Do you think these are all gonna be good comparable properties? No. Not so much. So what I really wanna do then is, let me see where my subject property is. I really just want to use these. So we'll come down here. This one's withdrawn, I don't want that. Of my solds, 1796, I want, I don't want these properties. I can go down here, I'm okay with those. So what I really want is just those. Um, select sort option. Come down at this date, this price, first before, but I want, they've changed this on me. They completely changed this on me. They used to have it where you could sort it from distance from your subject property. Um, and now they have changed that. It's interesting. Okay, so we'll kind of go through and work through it. In this case, 1753, Kensmere 3292. What is the age on this one? Uh, this was built in 1993. Okay. So I want to use properties that are similar to that. So this one was built in 93, 32, 1796. We can grab that. This is a different neighborhood, 211 Doxbury, Prestwick, 3294, Prestwick. That one's not in the neighborhood either. Eric is Tarpon Springs? Why in the world? Hold on a second. Something with this is. Lab seller, 32, no pond, advanced info. Subdivision, let's do this. Do that. Let's see what we get. Normally, when it pops up, when you're looking for things nearby, it stays pretty close. It doesn't range out that far. Um, it's still, these are all wintry? There's no way. This is actually called wintry. But see, even when I'm doing these, sometimes it's not as clean. As I would like it to be, and it takes a little bit of size. Price. There were ten in the. Well, let's drop this. Ten is the minimum that it'll let you do. All right, wind tree. Let's see if that wind tree. I don't know that every agent puts it in the same way though. Okay, let's try it again. All right, well, I'm still gonna do that. It's really interesting. Okay. You can't on this one, and that's one of the things with this system that I don't love, is you can't just draw the circle, right? Um, and I can't search within a certain radius. The specific MLS numbers mm -hmm. from when we go into matrix, put that in there. Correct. Add exactly. Um, but I'm just showing you guys the kind of the the pros and cons of all of them. This is obviously one of the cons in the new update that they have. I've got six active, three pendings, 19 solds, and two withdrawn canceled. So I'm going to look here 17, 16, 15, 15, 16. 240, okay. Now this 150 is definitely an outlier. When I'm looking at everything else that's 211 to 250, um, if I see something that's 150,000, I know that's probably to your point, like a bank owned short sale or something that just really looks out of place. Alternatively, you know, if I'm looking up here, everything's 255 and I've got one that pops up for 300,000, that one's probably not a good comparable. Withdrawn. Hawbuck. I don't think that's in the neighborhood, but we're going to leave it for the moment. 
And now I see over here, my high is 349,000. So I know there's some weird outlier. There it is. It still says Tarpon Springs. I don't know why I did that. Okay. And then 202 is 205 is actually low. And I'm going to show you guys how to make adjustments. I'm just trying to clean up this list a little bit. 17 is low. 50, 254, 249, and then let's get rid of the 211. Okay, and I went for 305, that one's way out of my range here. There it is. Okay, so now when I'm looking at my summary of prices over here, I've got a low end of 225 and a high end of 287. So that's, I typically try and keep within about a $50,000 spread. Uh, if you're in something like a neighborhood where all these homes should be pretty similar, if you have much more than a $50,000 spread, then either you're in a very, very high end neighborhood where you've got, you know, a million two next to 900,000, you know, you'd have big spans that way. But in this $250,000 price point, you really don't want to have more than about a $50,000 spread. Now in here, I can click on this details and adjustments button. And you'll notice that I can, again, click through the pictures, see what we're looking at. And we've already looked at this one. Um, I can come down here now and I can make adjustments. So in this case, we're gonna say granite or no granite. And I don't know if this one actually good or not. So at the $250,000 price point, I would say this one, our subject does have granite, this one does not. So 3,500 to 6,000, all other things being equal, I'll probably do 4,500. Now in this case, this is going to be a positive because I wanna bring that value up to make it comparable to mine. Let's say for example, this one had a pool. Subject doesn't. I would do negative, here. Uh, the pool is an in-ground pool, 10,000 to 17,500, depending on the type of pool. So if you've got a concrete pool or something that's really well done with a waterfall and you know all those things, I'm gonna give it a higher value. In this case, we'll just do 10,000, just so I can show you guys. I want negative 10,000 and save it. So you notice that what I've done now is I have a total adjustment, a net adjustment of negative 5,500. So I've gone in to make this home the same as mine. You know, I'm adjusting or deducting value based on what I know of this property and what my subject has. So I can go in and I can just keep making adjustments and tweak it. Let's come down here. Um, what's our there's one that's higher, 287. So come down here to details and adjustments. Three bedroom, two bath. Now this does have a pool home. So this one was 287, but it has a pool. So in this case, I will deduct the value of a pool. So pool is going to be, what did we just say? 10,000, 10, yeah. So minus $10,000. Um, and I'll just use that. And I'm just picking a few of them just so I can show you guys what it looks like. Okay, I don't want that one, don't want those. 275, let's see what this one has. This is sold. So again, Crescent Oaks, it's got a pool as well. So this one was 275, but again, I'm gonna come down here and say, nope, this was a pool home. All right, so we would go through, we would make adjustments as needed on all of our listings, and then we would come down here and customize our report. Now, for your theme, this modern green and teal is the one color that we have that best matches the Florida luxury color scheme of our listing presentation. If you notice, if you were to click down up at the top, they have like um, uh, Berkshire Hathaway colors. They have, uh, yeah, there's Berkshire Hathaway. They have um, Century 21, Coldwell Banker, blah, blah, blah. So they actually have color schemes in here for some of the other brands, Sotheby's. Um, with ours, the one that matches the best is this modern green and teal. 
and you can see the color scheme approximately. It's pretty similar to how our listing presentations look. So if you're actually integrating a CMA into your listing presentation, this is a really nice way to do it. I'm gonna apply that theme. For the layout, I just want two photos. As soon as this finishes thinking. There we go. For the photo layout, I typically choose two photos. Uh, you can do whichever one you want. This is just the one that I've always defaulted to. For the template, I can choose all pages or I could just do comps only. I could do a buyer CMA. I could do a pre-listing package. Uh, for demonstration, when I'm doing it myself, I typically do the pre-listing package. But for demonstration for you guys, I'm just going to click all pages. And again, give it a second. For the font, I just use their default font. If you wanted to get really fancy and creative, you could go in there and change it. In this case, I tend not to. Uh, there are some things over here. So Tom Ferry pages and some Power Pack pages. These are actually add-ons that you would have to buy. So if you have Tom Ferry as your real estate coach or something like that, then I believe you get access to some of those. Uh, but the ones I use are within the standard template. So again, my cover letter, if you want to see what it looks like, if you hover over, you get this little creepy looking eyeball right next to it. You guys can see that. If you click on it, it'll actually give you a preview of what this would look like. Come on. All right, I'll show you guys when it's done. Uh, normally you click on it and it pops right up. You can do things like your agent resume. You've got some, our company information. What is a CMA? Contact me. This is a lot of paperwork, and normally I would not include all of these. You can kind of go through and read them and decide which ones you want. But I like to have them all in here so I, when I walk through this report, I can show you what some of them are. Now, in this case, we've got Bob Seller. It's publishing. It takes about 60 seconds for it to pop up. And when that does, we'll come back to it. Come back over here. So let's talk about what we've got. So for Cloud CMA, the pros, it's a very clean way to present information. It has some market statistics, which I'm going to show you as soon as this one finishes processing. It's got some different ways to format and present the information, mm -hmm. and it can be integrated into your listing presentation. Some of the cons, it can be a bit overwhelming. It doesn't work great for some properties, and now, as we just saw, it doesn't do a great job of letting you draw a map or pick a distance from your property. Uh, that's actually a, a new issue that I had not run into before. So, just a second, this should be done. So I'm gonna show it to you guys before we move on. Actually here, this is the one I did in the last class. So I'll just show it to you. So it pops up as a comparative market analysis. If you don't have a photo of it, it'll default to the Google satellite view. Um, again, this is the one I did the last time I did this class. This is your cover letter. So, dear Greg, because that's what I said the seller's name was, I appreciate the opportunity to share my business plan with you. In order to talk about the current happenings, blah, 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 you can kind of read through it and see if it's something you want to use. This is what is a CMA. So it gives them a little bit of, you know, information about what it is that we're giving them. Got my contact information in there. Florida Luxury Realty Branding is already there. You notice that the color scheme actually looks pretty good together. Now the map of comparable homes, so it shows, in this case, I only use the properties that were right here together in the same neighborhood. It shows, this is the subject property, these were sold, this one was pending. I'm gonna give the summary. So three bedroom, two bathrooms, all built. You know, this one's kind of the outlier, 89, 91. Oh no, I'm sorry, this is the outlier, 95. Um, so we did a little bit of an adjustment for the age on that one. Of the one that's pending, it has all that. So for the sold listings, the average is 1,411 square feet for 206,000. The one pending, there's only one, so it's 1,383 at 208. It goes through and shows the listings that we chose. So it's got the two photos. It's got all the information that was in from the MLS. So because this is Cloud CMA, it does pull the information from the MLS. It's got some other photos of the property. This is the next one. Again, the second page will be all the photos. The third one goes through all this. So let me just 
don't have a seizure watching the screen as I scroll too fast. Okay, let me get down past all my listings. Okay, now down here, I have my price adjustments. So in this case, I said one that was a no pool, I gave 3,500. So for actual price was 2049. I did an adjustment of 3,500, which gave me a comparable price of 208, and I changed it 1.71%. So under the listing that I make changes to, it shows what my change was and what the value was so that the seller can see that. And when I get to analysis, it shows me the sold. So again, highest price was 225, the lowest price was 195 with an average of 206, an average price per square foot of 147, an average of 30 days, 37 days on the market, and there were eight sold listings used in these averages. For pending, again, Highest was 208, low was 208, because there's only one. And this went under contract in 10 days. Or this is one of the things that I really like. This shows on average, homes sold for 99.2% of the list price. So if I have a seller that says, hey, I want to list it really high to be able to come down. Well, is that something that really happens in this neighborhood? No. They're getting 99% of asking price. They're listing it right and selling it for full asking. So how about we list it at the right price and then you really don't have to, to come off because a lot of sellers have this idea that every buyer is gonna try to beat me down. Like if I list it for 49.9, I'm gonna have to sell it for 42. Well, in this neighborhood, that's just not the case. If we list it for 49 or 149.9 and that's actually the market value, we're gonna get you maybe 149,000, you know, we may give them the 900 bucks or whatever, but we're closing at over 99% of list price. And on average, it takes 37 days to set your home to sell. So in this neighborhood, now again, we have one that took 115 and some of these others were three, four, six, 29, 27. So if your seller is calling you on day 14 going, hey, why don't we have a contract yet? Well, remember at the very beginning when we talked about how it's really going to take 30 days? We're halfway there. We're getting there. We're getting traction. Here's what we're doing. But it just sets that expectation right from the beginning. And then for closing, this is something I honestly don't include when I keep it, but I just put it in here. Why you need a real estate professional. This is kind of a piece of information. If you like it, use it. If you don't. Intelligent pricing and timing. So again, this is the same information that was presented in the matrix CMA, but it's just done a little bit differently. The intelligent pricing and timing, same thing that we had before, just presented in a slightly different way. This is a page that I use a lot. So curb appeal, curb appeal a first impression that lasts. So this talks a little bit about the importance of your curb appeal. So what does your house look like when the buyer pulls up? If there's weeds everywhere and the front of the house is all in disarray, it doesn't matter that you've updated every bit of stuff on the inside of this house. If it doesn't look nice when they pull up, they've already made an impression of your home. So this talks about some of the things that they could do. Staging your home, again, the same thing, just some piece of information that is out there. I do like this showing an open house checklist. So I call this the five minute. So the essential five minute cleanup, Put your pets in daycare, sleep cages, or take them with you. There should be a warning, blah, blah, blah. Buyers with allergies may appreciate knowing in advance if you have pets. Turn on the lights, open the drapes, turn on the lights so buyers can really see. Oh, that's my top. And then give the buyer privacy. The buyer can come to your, or cannot come to your home without being accompanied by an agent, so they'll be more comfortable touring the home if you're not there. You know, we've all had those sellers to go, I really don't want to leave my house for showings. I really want to be here. Well, what we found is when the seller is there, statistically, the buyer's gonna spend 30% less time in the home and not look around as well as they would if the home was vacant or the owner was not there. So we wanna give them the opportunity to spend a few minutes in the house, really fall in love with it, rather than just being really uncomfortable because the seller's sitting right there. And I can't give my honest opinion because I don't wanna risk offending the seller who's sitting in the other room. So if at all possible, try and get your sellers to leave for showings. And then this moving checklist, again, this is something you could include or something you could give to them later. Um, just some different information, some helpful tips. And then for the guidance. So the value of your home. Every home is different. The number one rule in real estate is location, location, location. 
size, number of bedrooms, things like that. Again, it's something you could include, but this report is 50 pages long. If I'm in a listing presentation, do you think I'm gonna go through 50 pages of information with that seller? No. They're gonna be more glassed over than you guys are right now, and you're interested in it. So I would never do a full 50 page CMA. But again, for the purposes of the class, I wanted to show you what all you could include if you really wanted to. Do you guys have any questions about any of that so far? Go ahead. Uh, what happens when you don't have a pending, sold, or active listing in the same community? So that's where it gets to be tricky because technically an appraiser, when at all possible, is supposed to use something in the community. So what I would typically say is try and go back a little bit farther, you know, instead of going back six months, maybe go back 12 to 18 months mm -hmm. and then do market adjustment valuation. So if it closed 18 months ago and we see that this neighborhood has gone up 18% in the last 12 to 18 months, then I would basically say, okay, this sales price plus 18% would give me an approximate comparable value from today. Um, if you can't, then you want to try and find truly similar properties as close as possible. So if you have to go to the next neighborhood over, just understand that to the buyer, there may be some variances between that neighborhood and mine. So it's not, you know, it's as much an art as a science that we do the best we can, but there are circumstances where there just aren't truly good years. Years. Okay. I'm going to lease a house in which is in Costa Rica. But actually, yep. like a mile and a half around, no house has been sold, no even in three hundred days. Wow. So, but in which is has kind of similar right. designs. Mm -hmm. in every, in every yeah, I mean, Country Way is one section of West yeah, Chase, but, but if you went you over to. The house is basically the same. Right. So, in that case, you could get away with going over into the next community or the next section of West Chase and using some comparables in there. Yeah, you can get away with that. Right. Uh, this you is know, there really are certain cool. areas of town, even in Spring Hill and others, where they don't really have true communities. They just have like this section of houses and that section of houses where there is no community. It's Spring Hill phase one, phase two, phase 17, phase 23, you know. So that's where you get into, you want to, work in geographic proximity if you have to go outside the neighborhood. No. Uh, one of my first buyers, mm -hmm. we, she bought a house in East Greenwood. Mm -hmm. You know, when you live, uh, it's the 52 or 54, I don't remember. Mm -hmm. uh, the beginning of Spring Hill, as you said, you have a community. Up by Shady Hill. Another one. Right. You have another one very similar, all of them. Right. And the house was 169. Okay. My client offered 152. Okay. 160. And then, but the appraisal came for about 15,000. Mm -hmm. So the seller, uh, the, the seller uh, said, mm -hmm. you the place. Right. There was a second appraisal, the second appraisal came to the same amount. Okay. And the appraiser said that even when the houses were similar, you were not allowed to compare with the house that two miles away. Right. So they can't go more than two miles. Although the houses were the same. Correct. Same right. So I have a good friend of mine that's an appraiser, and she and I have had lunch repeatedly because I just throw things like this at her. Within and their rules. I was in that with my colleague, which is. Yep, exactly. You have to stay within two miles. They are not allowed to use a comparable that's more than two miles away. Now, where that gets really funny is if you have something like a 12 acre farm or something where the next nearest 10 to 12 acre farm is more than two miles away. Well, then they have to start doing some exclusions and things like that because it's a very unique thing. But when you're doing one in a community, they have a two mile circle and that's all they can really use. So it does get to be a little bit tricky in some of these cases because, you know, we're our hands are tied a little bit. So again, with Cloud CMA, it's a very clean way to present. So as you were going through, like it was all nice and neat, it was organized well, you know, those kinds of things. It does have the market statistics like we talked about. 
you can format it a couple of different ways. You can change your fonts. You can change those kinds of, you know, how your photos are laid out. But again, if, it, if I've got a 50 page CMA, that's just daunting. That's too much information. Greg. So the last one is NAR RPR. So let's go over and take a look at that. Greg, can you hear me? Okay. Greg? No. Oh, yeah, I guess not. And there's a link there on the uh, matrix on the thumbnails. Mm -hmm. To get to that RPR, right? Uh, there are, actually, yes. So RPR is right here on the right hand side. Oh, at the top, you mean? Oh, right here. Yeah. Interesting. I've never used that before. Good to know. Thank you. Uh, all right. So in this case, yeah, when you're in the matrix, you have up at the top right, you have your RPR listing. There you go. Even I learned something new today. So it pops up the address. Now, in most cases, and the reason I don't do that is because in most cases, when you're taking a listing, it won't already be in the MLS. So, you know, you could go into NARRPR.com and then you would just type in your property address here. It should pop up with that information and then you can click go. But yes, if it's something like an expired or withdrawn that you're listing, then you could. In this case, what we're going to do is create. And then we're always going to do a comparative analysis. There is a sales comparison analysis. And if you click on what's the difference, they have a, a short little two minute video here that tells you the difference. The short answer is we're always going to do a comparative analysis. When we come in here, we're going to first confirm the facts. Start with the facts. So in public records, the taxes don't have the number of bedrooms in here for whatever reason. Um, that's why it's important for us when we're talking to the seller to find out exactly how many bedrooms, how many bathrooms, things like that, because sometimes they genuinely don't pop up. In that case, so let's say we didn't have this listing data and this was blank, I would come over here and make it three. You know, I'd actually put in what it is in there. If the seller told me that it was 1,800 square feet, but tax records show it is 1,636, then we're going to have a little bit of a discussion about what that actually, why the difference is there. Um, I tend not to worry about total rooms. Some people do, some don't. Uh, foundation, almost everything in Florida is a slab if it's been built in the last 25 years. Uh, there are still some homes that do have crawl spaces and things like that, but part of it is kind of knowing the community. And if you're not sure and the seller's not sure, you can always go in the MLS and see if there are any properties nearby that you know might give you a clue. So in this case, we're just going to confirm the facts. And then now we're going to find comparables. So we're going to click this Find Comps button. Now, one of the things that I really like about RPR, so my little orange house here is my subject, but over here on the property type, RPR is one of the few. So let's say you do a manufactured home. This is one of the few systems that will allow you to just search for other manufactured or mobile homes. RPR doesn't have a way to do this, and you could do it in the in matrix, but within Cloud CMA and RPR. Um, if you have something different like a condo or a manufactured home or a duplex, Cloud CMA doesn't do a good job of letting you just sort by property type. Uh, RPR does a much better job with that. So I always like to point that out because every once in a while I get a manufactured home that somebody wants me to sell. And Cloud CMA, especially if it's a manufactured home surrounded by single family homes, it'll grab those single family homes to develop a value for the manufactured home. And it's just not, not comparing apples to apples. So in this case, I want two to unlimited. We're going to say four and I want two to three bathrooms. This one's going to give me 1200 to 21. If I'm using my rule of 10%, I want, I know, 1450 to 1800. I'm not as worried about lot size because I know in this community they're all very similar. So now we're going to search. Now, what's interesting is you see how I've got some up here and some over here. On this one, I can actually draw a shape and use a polygon and I can just grab 
the ones I want. Um, I don't know if that's really comparable. I'm going to try and stay up here a little bit. And I can kind of grab it around whichever ones I want. So I want the ones right here around Wintry Boulevard. And I only want to search in this area. So now what I've done is I've effectively limited my search pool to only the ones that are more or less on the same street. Now, again, it has an option we're done. I'll go back and show you. It has what's called an RVM. And whether or not I put a lot of faith in, faith in the RVM is looking at their uh, confidence. So it says like one to five stars on the confidence level of the RVM. So depending on how confident they are, depends on how much I use it. But I always come in here, 1565 square feet, built in 93 over here. So this is a good comparable. Um, and it shows half mile away, 0. 0.6 miles away, 0. 0.18 miles away, 0. 0.2. So I can see if I've got something out here that's you know 1.5 miles away or something, then I would realize, hey, maybe this is not truly a good comparable. Uh, 1636, 1581, 1636. And then again, so these are the recently sold. Down here, I have active for sales. Because again, this is going to be our competition. Uh, this one's been on the market 42 days, 259, 156, 1661. I'll go ahead and use it. Uh, this one, again, it's only been on six days. And this one's only been on three days. So. Let's update our valuation and close. Now, what I could do is I could actually go back to these comparables and I could make adjustments. This one doesn't have where it lets you put in a dollar amount. So for the others, I said it was $10,000 for a pool. With this one, it's is this one better or worse than the subject? So I'm going to say, eh, this one's a little bit worse. So by scrolling it down, each click, okay, well, I've adjusted it by 2,800 or 4,000 or 5,000. So it shows you what the adjustment is. In this case, this one's 211. We're going to say this one's worse as well. And at 255, maybe this one's better. Yeah. I'll put them back to same just to kind of keep all things equal. Actually, we're going to say this one is worse. Okay. Now I can update my valuation. Oh, there was actually a total of nine. So if I came back in here, I could go to the next page. I could do the same thing for each one. Um, but in this case, we're just gonna leave it alone. Now, I have this result of my comparative analysis. So it came up with 247,801, and it gives me a range of 233 to 258. If I click this edit button, I can actually go in and put in my own value. So if I said, you know what, we should list it for 249.9 with a range of, we're gonna say 233,000 to 258,500, because I like using more round numbers. And then I can save it. So what it does is it takes the information they had with all the $233 or whatever, and just makes it a little bit nicer and clear. So again, I'm just going to create the report and use the seller's report because we're generating this for the seller. If I want, I could include the seller's name. I could type in a message that's going to go on the their report. It's going to pull my information from the MLS. So me, Florida Luxury, the address, the phone number. And then I can include what information I want on my cover street, on my cover sheet. Now this cover sheet, I don't have the ability to customize the way that I can in Cloud CMA. I can't change the color pattern, I can't change any of that, but I can choose what information I want to include. So office address, office name, broker website, broker name, broker logo, my name, the agent photo, license number, blah, blah, blah. I can choose what of those I want included. And then let's just go ahead and run the report. So it says, hey, you're gonna get a pop-up message. We'll actually hear a doorbell. Let me turn my volume back up when it's done for the sake of time, because that can take, depending on how many are being run at the moment, um, that one may take a moment. So let me come over to reports and I'll show you one that, oops, one of the reports that I've done recently. No, I guess I haven't been in the system recently. You can tell I'm not selling a ton because normally I have my recent reports right here and I can just click on one and show you. 
So we'll come back. We'll hear the doorbell here in a minute. And we'll, uh, we'll come back to it. So within RPR, some of the pros, it has the most options for customization of the report. You can just search property type. You can just draw the circle around the area you want, things like that. It has plenty of information that be, can be included, and I'll show you that when the report comes in. Uh, most RPR reports, if I include everything that was checked in there, uh, will probably be about 85 pages. Um, and it's great for non-single family home property. So again, manufactured homes or condos, things like that. Some of the cons, like I said, an 80 page report is just crazy. And it's too long for any seller to really pay attention to all of it. So bear with me one second, this should pop up here. More details. Um, one of the things I wanted to show you here too, this is the report elements. So you can choose before you go to create it, what all you want to include. Now, obviously, there it is. Um, freaks my dog out every time that happens. She goes run into the front door and it's crazy. Um, let me take my bookmarks off. So this is branded Florida Luxury Realty. This is the seller's report created by me. It's got our team logo, the information, all that jazz. Again, the Google satellite image. List price was 254.9. My comparative analysis said 249.9. Their current estimated value was 252.760. And that was based on, it's a five-star confidence. So you notice what they came up with and what I came up with were pretty close. Um, I didn't actually work through the same adjustments like I normally would, but if they have a five-star confidence on it and you're not really close to it, then there was probably a mistake somewhere. Um, again, in this neighborhood, because there have been so many sold properties, they can pretty confidently put it together. Um, if there's only been one or two sales, then you might see like a two and a half star confidence or something like that. Then again, the public remarks for this property, because it's already in the MLS, it's generating all this information. The homeowner's facts, it's going to pull it in. It shows all the stuff because again this was something that was generated from the mls normally you won't have quite as much information in here so property photos if this house has ever been listed in the past it will actually pull historical photos of what the listing looked like previously so when you're looking at it you can kind of get an idea of what it looked like the last time it was sold and if the seller said no we haven't made any changes we've only owned it for two years you can get a pretty good idea of what it is before you walk in so it's got a few pages of photos, and then this is the historical photos, which is normally where it would start. Um, so you can see from when they bought it, it looks like they might have done some painting, um, but probably not a lot of updating actually. Now we can see what the property history was. So 2006 to 2008, this house was you know way up under 300. 2010, we took a nosedive. It's pretty obvious. But now we're kind of on this upward tick, but you notice that this is starting to kind of plateau a bit. So where we had this rapid uptick, now you can tell it's starting to kind of plateau off a little bit. So if we're looking ahead toward 2020, you know, while we're still coming up, we're not coming up at the peak that we were from 12 to 14, where we gained, you know, 20, $30,000 in two years. This just gives some information, the legal description of the property, the sales history. So from 2006, I'm sorry, the mortgage history. Uh, 2006, they took out a second mortgage. The reason this is helpful is you can actually go in here and when you're working up your seller's net sheet, you can get an idea. Okay, they took out a $52,000 loan in 2006 and it was a, uh, doesn't tell me how long it was. Um, some of the others will actually tell you it was a 20 year note or something like that. You can go in and do an amortization calendar or calculator and you can actually figure out pretty close what their payoff is. So when you give them a seller net sheet and you walk in and go, okay, so this is probably pretty close to your payoff. And then they call the company and go, yeah, that was within a few hundred bucks. Again, you position yourself as that expert. Now the seller's report, again, this one's a little bit confusing to read just because it's a little bit muddled. Uh, I don't usually include this one for that reason, but what it shows is the percentage of change 
they're doing price changes. So we're doing about a 2% price drop, a 1% price drop. These active properties have all had price drops recently. So what that tells me is the market is not shooting up and buyers are not buying quite as fast in Trinity as they have been in the past. We're actually watching these homes kind of trickle down. This is kind of a cool presentation as well. It shows the area as a whole. So these dark black areas tend to be your waterfront homes and then up the river. So again, as you would imagine, these are the properties that are going to have more value. These white areas are the ones that have lower value. So you can see using this kind of cloud map where your home falls based on what properties around it are looking like in terms of pricing. So it's just a cool different, different way to show it. Again, the median home price in the area is 255,000, which is up 3.6%. The median listing price is 270,000, up 4%. Median days to sell is 62 days. So again, homes in this comparable are taking 60 days to sell. I don't really want to take a 60 day listing on this property because it's probably going to take me around 60 days to sell it. And the sales volume is 115, which is almost flat from what it was last year. Now, homes in this case in 30 days, they're selling approximately 2.2% under list price. So that means we're getting 97.8% of asking price in sold. If it's on the market 30 to 60 days, now we're selling two and a half percent less. If it gets 61 to 90 days, we're selling almost 3% less. For whatever reason, the 90 to 120 days, it ticks up a little bit. And then more than 120 days, it's back to 3.2. What we're finding is the majority of homes are selling in two or in the 31 to 60 day range. So that way we can set that expectation with the seller we're probably going to get you under contract in that 30 to 60 days. So they're not calling you after day 10 going, hey, what's wrong? Why is my house not sold yet? It's always better to just set that expectation from the beginning. Now the average price adjustments, and this is updated monthly, again, within the first 30 days, typically those homes that don't sell are doing a 4% reduction. It goes all the way down to about 5% when you get over the 120 day mark. This is the market health. So just another one again, you can see that, you know, while we're ticking up, we're not ticking up as sharply as some other areas. The sales volume, this is pretty typical for Florida. You know, in the middle of the summer, sales always go down because everybody's on vacation. You know, right before school comes in, they start to tick back up. We always have the Christmas slump. We come back with a vengeance between January and January. Uh, January and July, then we have our summer slump, blah, blah, blah. So you can kind of see what the market has been doing over time. In this area, listing inventory, 338 have been single family homes, 34 have been condos or townhomes, nine vacant lots and one farm. So if I am listing a farm in this area, you think I'm gonna be able to get a really good comparable? Probably not, because there's only been one other one that sold. What does that also tell you? There may not be a huge pool of buyers for farms in this area. So this is just information to kind of pop in and show what's there. But again, this thing is 92 pages long and I'm not gonna walk you through all 92 pages. Um, there's a few in here that I wanna touch on before we get down. Again, the comps map, just showing you all the homes we picked were in the same approximate area. Uh, and then it's got the side-by-side -side reports and things like that. Let me scroll down because under all this, all these pages are comparables. There we go. In here, it does have a seller pro sheet or a seller net sheet. So you can use this one. We have one in the back office that I actually prefer, um, but just to show you that it's in there. And then about RPR, just telling you about the service. And then I guess Florida Luxury automatically generates the affiliated business as well. But a 92 page report, if you walk in with a report this thick, the seller's gonna go, yeah, I think we're done. Uh, you know, you wanna have some good information and part of the difficulty of a CMA is finding that balance between giving them what they're looking for and overwhelming them with information. One of my problems, I tend to be the person who wants all that information. So, 
I tend to not be bogged down with that. So I'm like, guess what? I know all this information and blah, blah, blah. And the seller's like, just tell me what my house is worth. So that's something that I've had to learn over the years is before I make a decision, I want every piece of analysis that I can get on that decision. I don't impulse buy anything. I'm already looking for my next computer that I'll probably buy six months from now. So I'm already kind of researching because that's how I am. So if you know your seller and know that they're very analytical, you may want to include some others. Otherwise, you kind of create a baseline of things that you always use and just present that. So some of the takeaways from this class. You just saw three different ways to do the exact same thing. Each one have their own pros and cons, and ultimately you'll find one that you prefer. Some agents love cloud CMA. Some use RPR, and some really like the matrix one. It's all up to, to personal preference, and I still end up using a variety of all three. So if I'm doing a single family home in a neighborhood, I may jump over to cloud CMA. If I'm doing something obscure, or I can't get exactly what I want in CMA, I'll jump over to RPR and do it. There's just no one system that works exceptionally well. Now, before you present the suggested value, you wanna ask the seller, which home of the ones that I just showed you do you think is your biggest competition? Because what it does is it gets them thinking about, oh, okay, well, you know, these other homes, this one also had granite that didn't have a pool but has a pond view. This is my best competition. Okay, cool. Well, based on those facts, what do you think your home is worth now? Because they may have had an idea before you walked in the door that my home was worth this. Well, now I've presented you all this information and now we're having a dialogue. So what I'm doing is I'm setting that seller up to be on my path. So if they thought when I walked in the door, their home was worth 300,000, but I've just shown them some information that everything's in the 275 range, do you think they're probably thinking, well, based on all that, probably 275, 279. Okay, cool. Now I've already covered that gap from the 300 they thought it was worth when I walked in the door to the 275 it's actually worth. So by asking these questions, I can get them to buy in to where I'm taking them. So what do you think your home is worth? Now, always, always, always check Zillow to see what Zillow says about their house. I will tell you that I put about that much stock in what Zillow says, but I guarantee you they will have looked at it. They will know what Zillow told them their home is worth. And then the other thing is to print other properties that were not priced to sell. So if you notice in this community that there were five expireds and they were all you know, higher than what you think this home would be worth, print those out and take them with you and show the seller, okay, well, you thought your house was worth 300. Well, here's five other homes in this community that were also priced at 300 that didn't sell. I don't want you to have that same experience. And then you wanna include other homes in close proximity that aren't really comparable. Oh, Johnny around the corner got 395 for his house. So mine has to be worth 450. Okay, cool. Well, what you don't realize is Johnny's house is a thousand square foot bigger than yours with an extra bedroom and a pool. It's not a comparable, but they're going to go, well, no, I mean, I know that he got that price for his house. Well, yeah, of course he did, but we're not comparing apples to apples, but understand that the seller by and large doesn't do this every day. They don't know these things. They're given one piece of information and they run with it. Oh, Zillow told me it's worth $3.95. Awesome, Zillow sucks. I don't know what to tell you. So these are the kinds of things that, and what I do is the homes that are not really comparable, but that sold really high, so kind of those outliers, I keep them in my bag because I know they're gonna come up. So that's when they're like, oh yeah, Johnny around the corner. And I'm like, oh, is it that one? You know, the one that sold for 395? Okay, cool, let's talk about this one for a second. Well, his house is 2,700 square feet and yours is 17. Is that, you know, that's not the same, right? We're looking at price per square foot. He got this price per square foot. If I do the math and put your house at the same, same price per square foot, we're in the same number. We're in the same exact ballpark. Yes, I'm looking at that, but those things are not the same. And those are the types of things that are going to position you as the expert to get them to trust you, to trust that you know what you're doing, that you're not just the salesperson that walked in trying to make a commission.
Now, there's always one home in the neighborhood that's sold over value. So this is Johnny's house. This is what we were just talking about. Mr. Jones around the corner, blah, blah, blah. You want to have that print out. You want to be able to talk about that. And then always have a bit of a range. So for example, even though my CMA said 179, we're going to have a conversation because you're going to have a low price, a middle price, and a high price. So, okay, Mr. Seller, you've got to be across the country in 60 days. We're not going to list it at top value where it's not going to go under contract for 62 days. We're going to talk more about the, the middle to low price because we need to get you going. We need to get you what you need and we need to get you out. You're on a time crunch. The middle price is today's retail value or if the home is in average condition. So again, in the low price, you walk in and say, well, hey, every other house in this neighborhood has granite and you know, updated flooring and new lights and all this, and yours is not updated. Well, then obviously we're not comparing apples to apples. Middle price is, okay, your home is pretty average for the neighborhood. It has very similar features, similar condition, or a high price, which is above retail value, a home that's in immaculate condition. Oh, this was the builder's model that I bought six months ago. <coughs> Okay, cool. It's going to have some features and some functions that other homes wouldn't necessarily have, or it's in a community of homes built in the 1970s, 1980s, but you just came in and put $100,000 into this house. So, you know, we'll have that high price, but part of where we list it in this range depends on the seller, their needs, their desires, what they're trying to do. So when you're creating a CMA, what are the important things to consider about the subject property? Uh, square footage, uh, bedrooms, bathrooms. Yep. Uh, what else? Pool, not pool. Um, Lot size. Yep. Size of the backyard, all that good stuff. Yep. Absolutely. And then when comparing sizes, what is the percentage on either side that we'll use? Ten percent. Ten percent. Good job. Do you come out right away as soon as you walk in the door with your price range? No. We want to get them to that, that point. Again, part of the finesse of the listing presentation, especially once you get to the CMA, is finding that balance between overwhelming them with information and not giving them enough. And it, it's different for everybody. Some of them have it down to a finesse. They walk in, they know their listing presentation is 43 minutes. I know. I walk in the door, you're gonna give me the tour, it's gonna to take nine minutes. I'm gonna go from there, I'm gonna talk about this and I'm gonna spend four minutes on this, seven minutes on that, we're gonna spend 12 minutes on the pricing, we're gonna sign paperwork and I'm out the door. Like there are agents that have it down to this. I don't know how they do it because just like us, every seller is different, so, but yeah, I've got friends that literally know almost to the minute how long your listing presentation will go. So to each his own. And then do you give the seller all 80 pages of your CMA? Definitely not. I typically would have it. So if you've got a seller that you're like, hey, I've got this full report, I'd be happy to email it to you if you want to take a look at all the market statistics and all of that, by all means, email it to them if they want it. But when I'm doing my listing presentation, I try not to have it over 30 pages. And of the 30 pages, that's including my comparables, that's including some of my market statistics and things like that. 30 pages is kind of my sweet spot. It's not so overwhelming, but it shows that I've done my homework and that's really what I want. So do you guys have any questions about any of the programs, pricing, doing adjustments, anything we talked about? So when you present it, what do you think about just bringing the laptop and preserving it? Sure, absolutely. Instead of all these pages, especially mm -hmm. those pictures. Right. You know, it's, it's hard to see it when it's printed out. Right. When it's yeah, I do. So I actually got this computer. If I flip it over, it becomes a tablet. So then I can just literally lay it down or prop it up like a TV, and then it just, I can sweep through and show it. Uh, that's actually one of the reasons that I bought this specific computer is because it has that versatility that I can go in and turn these in where I just flip it over and go, okay, let's slide through and I can show my listing presentation and my comparables and all that digitally. Absolutely. Do you have a question? Uh, is the type of construction has to do with the value of the frame versus block home? Mm -hmm. So here's the funny thing in Florida. People from up north are petrified of wood frame homes. I don't know what it is. I get it. 
But when you stick stucco on the outside of a wood frame home, you can't really tell the difference between a wood frame home and a block home. They're gonna look exactly the same. They're gonna be basically protected. These people, some of these homes in St. Pete, these wood frame homes have been there since the 1930s. I'm not as concerned with wood frame as long as you're gonna do a termite, you know, preventative on it and things like that. These wood frame homes have been around for almost a hundred years. But up north, they have summers where it's 95 degrees and winters where it's negative 20. Well, wood is not designed to handle those kinds of shifts. In Florida, we stay at 80% relative humidity and we stay at, you know, 50 to 95 degrees all year long. So the wood frame versus block, sometimes you're going to have buyers that go, don't show me anything but block homes. And then sometimes we have a conversation to say, okay, well, what's your aversion to wood frame? Well, in a hurricane, these things are going to blow away. Okay, cool. Well, here's St. Pete. Here's, you know, 57 houses that have been here since 1932. How many hurricanes have we had? You know, so sometimes it's just about that. Uh, I do have buyers that will buy nothing but block homes. They just, they have it in their head. It has to be a block home. That's what it has to be. So it's something to take into account, but it's not something that I would necessarily make an adjustment for because in some communities, almost all the homes are going to be one or the other. It's pretty rare that you're going to have wood frame block, wood frame block, wood frame, you know, that you're going to have a mixture of type of home. So by and large, if it's, you know, wood frame, then I try and use comparables that are also the same. But for valuation, some people just have preferences of one over the other. And in reality, I haven't been able to find in the years that I've done this that it really makes any difference. You know, builder type who built the home to me makes more difference than the type of home. You know, there are some builders that I'm like, I don't care how good the block is. I know the quality of your build. I wouldn't buy it. So, you know, that's just what it is. But any other questions? That's a great one. Any particular builders from the mind? Um, let me turn off the recording and then we'll talk. <laughs> uh, um, I had a customer who uh, knew how to do Lena. Mm -hmm. And um, what happens is that they didn't allow us to be inspectors. Yep. Although I was recommended by my broker, you do it, they didn't allow it. Correct. There are builders that will not allow outside inspections. Some of those builders I tend to stay away from. A couple of them, I'm, I might still recommend them. Um, there are builders, and I'll use DR Horton as an example. They have an outside company that actually does inspections on their homes at every phase. So you actually get a copy of the inspection report. And so they will not allow us to bring an inspector in because they already do that as part of their process. So there's, there's exceptions to every rule and things like that. But yes, there are new builders that will not allow outside inspections during the build process. There are others that are like, absolutely, if your buyer wants to pay for it, have them inspect it all the way. I don't care. So it just, it does vary from builder to builder and, and things like that. So, anything else? How would you make an adjustment for an unsightly home? <laughs> Very delicately. <laughs> um, what I would do is I would find something like um, functional obsolescence. You know, use phrasing like that that's just functional obsolescence. I've got a galley kitchen, and everybody now wants. In my particular case, it's, it's, there's an unsightly home that's on the way. Right. To somebody, and it's literally, it's purple, bright orange. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious how you would even make an adjustment for that. Um, I don't know that I would put it on paper, but I would kind of keep that in mind as part of my pricing strategy. Um, because I can't put on there, on the CMA, your neighbor's house looks like crap. <laughs> like, you know, I get that I'm not selling your neighbor's house, but it's something that I'm going to keep in mind. So when the seller says, hey, I want absolute top value, I'm going to try and delicately like bring them back from that a little bit. Um, but yeah, in your CMA, there's no good way to make that kind of adjustment. You can't quantify it specifically. So, you know, for the buyer of the house that's purple and orange, they love their house. They made a deliberate decision. 
Um, I'll share one other story before we break. I had a very good friend that listed a house and it's the only house I've ever seen that did not have a single picture of a kitchen. This kitchen had black and white subway tiles, black and red cabinets, and black and white countertops. It was horrible. Like you walked in and your eyes hurt. But sure enough, every other feature of the house was phenomenal. They just had it in their head. They wanted this 1950s diner kitchen. It's what they wanted. So this agent did not put a single photo of the kitchen in the MLS. And sure enough, there was a buyer that walked in and went, you know what? Not a huge fan of the kitchen, but I love everything else in this house enough. If I had seen that kitchen, I would have never come to look at it. But now that I'm here, I can fix that. So I'm going to buy the house. So sometimes it's just about if there is something very unique, very creative about this house, crazy paint or something like that. I might start by saying, okay, Mr. Seller, would you consider repainting that bedroom to something a little more neutral? You know, we want to give your house the biggest appeal possible. If not, I just might not take a picture of that bedroom. Or if I do take a picture of that bedroom, I just might not include it in the MLS. So it becomes this mitigated risk of showing everything versus putting your best foot forward. So when we're pricing and when we're doing that, we take all of this into account. And again, a CMA is as much an art as a science. There is no hard and fast, you know, I say your house is worth this, two other agents may have two totally different opinions. I'm going to be able to justify my opinion with numbers and statistics and facts. But you may have another agent that uses very similar ones, but does different values and different adjustments to compensate for their perceived value. There's just no perfect way to do it.